Oh, oh. Goodness gracious, try to keep, keep these people under check here. <laughs> tough life. It's tough. It's like herding cats. You know. Please. Hi, Burkhard. Um, Hello. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, we have one more minute and uh, we'll take a look to see if it should be on now. Yep, what's going on? Um, the talk should be not longer than 50, so between 45 and correct, correct, correct. 50. Yeah, you've seen them already, so. All right. Um, in one minute, half a minute, I'll start and put this up here. Mm. As you know, that's filled in. Okay. So let me welcome everybody uh, once again uh, to the uh, uh, Spice Spin Plus X seminar series talks uh, led here by myself. Uh, I also know I'm Karen Evisho City in the Duisburg now, on in collaboration with the uh, Collaborative Research Center Spin Plus X, led by Martin Schiemann and Burka Hildebrands in Kaiserslatte and Matthias Kluwe here in Mainz. As you know, uh, the talks are uh, Zoom uh, um, seminar style, uh, meaning that you would hear the speaker on the talk and please write your Q&A on the Q&A uh, directly uh, or raise your hands and I will give you the floor after the talk uh, is over and, uh, and control, you know, give uh, the different orders of, of the questions. And, and please, of course, check out the next talks that are coming up. Matthias Weiler will be next week, and where we have also the, the, uh, the next uh, weeks after uh, more talks. Uh, it is my pleasure to talk uh, to you briefly, uh, Yuri Mokrasov. Uh, he is actually an expert uh, in his acting now as the EU, but also uh, uh, in, in ULIC, and is an expert on topological transport in solids. Uh, and particularly a normal soil effect and spin hole effect, having done one of the best works, uh, some of the best works in the particular initial theory uh, on this front, and uh, also including some extremely good work in, uh, in scramionic uh, physics. So with that, I will stop sharing, and I will ask you, uh, uh, go ahead and please share the screen, and then we will be here. Uh, so let me, let me start sharing, wait a sec. Okay, share, and now uh, should be now. I have to remove the participants. Okay, good. Laser, laser pointer. Okay, so now everything seems okay. Hiro, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to give a talk in our uh, Spice seminar, and today I'm going to talk about detecting, imprinting, and switching spin chirality in magnetic materials. And this is really a collaborative effort of many people, of which several are present here. And I hope we can have some nice discussions after the talk. Now, when we talk about spintronics, we normally think, or we used to think in terms of collinear magnets. These are ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets. However, on the other hand, there is a whole world, rich world of chiral or non-collinear states, such as, for example, spin spirals, the main walls, canted magnets, skirmions, as well as frustrated magnets of different kind. And our way of looking at them is via the notion of chirality. And chirality is our way of making a sense out of complicated non-collinear arrangements that we can have in different magnets. And there are different flavors of chirality, if you wish. Uh, the ones that I'm going to discuss today and some of the main ones which are normally discussed are the so-called vector spin chirality, which gives you a sense of canting between two spins. That's for the beginning of the talk um, and which is behind categorization of the main walls, skirmions to some extent, as we will see, as well as uh, spin spiral states. There is the scalar spin chirality, which measures the angle between three spins that is a very important quantity in modern spintronics. And finally, there are more exotic uh, uh, chirality notions, such as, for example, octopolar chirality, which here, for the purposes of the talk, I write in a, in a sense where it is visible that it's a chiral quantity. So why do we want to study chirality? And uh, what is the motivation? And the motivation, of course, is that there is a real zoo of chiral states out there. And you have to really deal with these guys. Uh, it's not a joke. And moreover, there is recently a strong interest in learning 
how to manipulate different chiral states, for example, by electrical currents. Chiral states have a profound impact of energetics, transport, and dynamics, not only of chiral materials, but even on the level of collinear magnets, such as ferromagnets or antiferromagnets. They are the platform for advanced or topological concepts, such as teleportation, even entanglement, spin superfluidity, superconductivity, skirmions, chiral spill liquids, novel electronic topological states. And recently, um, an additional spice is added here by the fact that we realized in a good collaboration with Matthias Chloe and Christian Good that chirality, even in most trivial and dull magnets, um, has really interesting topological robust um, behavior. For example, robust recovery after ultra-fast excitation. That is all very nice. However, uh, one fundamental problem we're still facing, and that is the problem of trying to read out the chirality by spintronics means. And spintronics means that normally we have a black box, which is a magnetic sample, and we're allowed to apply fields to it, DC or external magnetic field, as well as laser excitations or terahertz pulses. And we have learned in the past very well how to determine the overall magnetization of our black box. However, with chirality, things are much more complicated. And in my talk, I will try to answer this question or to point the way of how we could read out chirality by the notion of chiral currents. I will analyze the chiral Hall effect in canted systems and in textures. I will introduce a new thing. Um, these are chiral spin currents. And I will try to underline the relation of these chiral currents to the Berry phase theory and to spin orbit torques. Then I will try to kind of show how we can use chiral currents for chirality switching. And in the last part of my talk, I will talk about chirality out of equilibrium, hidden or driven chirality due to magnons, thermal excitations, or uh, even laser excitations. So let me start. And uh, when we talk about readout of any sort of magnetic information, normally we talk about the anomalous Hall effect, a celebrated phenomenon for hundreds, you could say, um, of years already. And as a theoretician, you are normally doing what? You are calculating the so-called intrinsic Berry phase anomalous Hall effect, which is based in calculating the Berry curvature of occupied states, which can be relatively complicated in the brilliant zone. Um, on the experimental side, it has been very popular until recently to attribute the anomalous Hall effect in a material whichever complicated non-collinear structure it has to some sort of non-vanishing magnetization in the sample. And in principle, this theory seems to work uh, because we know that the anomalous Hall effect vanishes in collinear antiferromagnets, which have, uh, for example, PT symmetry. However, since more than 20 years, there is a whole stream of research which tells you that there is very rich physics of anomalous Hall effect in non-collinear antiferromagnets. For example, in coplanar antiferromagnets with spin orbit interaction, there can be anomalous Hall effect. We will consider the situation a little bit later. Um, one of the most celebrated ones is the anomalous Hall effect in non-coplanar antiferromagnets. In particular, those which can be characterized with so-called scalar spin chirality, which electron sees as an effective field as it hops around triplets of non-collinear spins. The corresponding name, the topological Hall effect, is meant to kind of bring together this real space topology with the Hall effect. And this is the effect which is extremely popular these days, because this is the effect to which we attribute any sort of deviations from this kind of linear in magnetization behavior of the anomalous Hall effect. And it became very popular also due to the physics of skirmions, where it is really studied in depth. And to see why this is so popular uh, is not so difficult. I do this on the example of magneto-optical effects, where you can postulate also the top topological part of magneto-optical effects, such as, for example, Kerr and Faraday effects due to scattering of light on this scalar chirality. And if you, for example, take uh, such material as iron manganese, which has no spin orbit interaction and which has no net magnetization of any kind, and you try to calculate 
the relation between chirality here, the dashed line, which you do by counting the spins in this material, and the calculated, for example, magneto-optical strength, you will see basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two effects. And that is very convenient. That's a very convenient platform to think about things because you calculate chirality, and this gives you a mean means to predict what is the whatever response that you are looking at. And therefore, it is nowadays postulated as some kind of universal probe for any sort of non-collinear magnetism in skirmions, heli magnets, or frustrated systems. But as a theoretician, for a long time, we know, uh, in particular as a theoretician, I'm sure there are also a lot of experimentalists who know that, that it is not that simple and that you can have a situations where the anomalous Hall effect is kind of counterintuitive. And uh, as a community, I think we all have to thank uh, Libor, Tomas, and Jairo for pushing forward this crystal Hall effect, because it gives a clear example of where the simple pictures break down. And the statement here is that when there is spin orbit interaction and the symmetry of your crystal is very low or lower than, uh, than high symmetry, in this case, you can have an anomalous Hall effect, even when the magnetization or any sort of chirality is vanishing in your system. So how to make sense out of all of this? And to do this, I will try to use or employ intensively in this talk, a toy model, which has only two atoms per unit cell um, in the beginning. So this is a honeycomb lattice of spins A and spins B. We have only two spins in the unit cell. Um, the model is simple. It includes the hopping, it includes the brush with spin orbit interaction, and it has the exchange term, which gives us the magnetization of, of the spins, obviously. But one thing we have to assume, um, that everything here is possible. So we don't make any assumption on the anomalous Hall effect in this system. What we do now is there is really not much that we can do in this system. We can choose an axis and we can count the spins with respect to this axis. And this counting is given by an angle theta between the spin and the axis. And two situations we will consider especially. One of them is that of a ferromagnet. We start with a ferromagnetic state and then we count it. And the collinear anti-ferromagnet, which we can also count. Now, as I said, we assume that there is we, we don't assume anything with respect to the shape of the anomalous Hall effect as a function of this canting angle theta. However, there is one conceptual step that you can make from this beast, and that is decomposition into symmetric and anti-symmetric with respect to canting parts. And this is quite important because the first part, which is the symmetric with respect to canting, is what we call the crystal Hall effect. This is the effect which is not sensitive to the sense of canting. It is the same for plus and minus uh, angle theta. And we call it crystal Hall effect because it accumulates all the anomalous Hall effect that we can have in the collinear state. For example, for um, the case of crystal Hall effect in antiferromagnets, that would be the thing. The other effect is what we call the chiral Hall effect because it is sensitive directly to the sense of chirality in your system. And it also vanishes identically by construction for the collinear state in my system. Now let's take a look using our model, whether this actually is a sensible decomposition. And we take a brush by ferromagnet and we can the spins, uh, we choose a certain axis and we can the spins by plus minus 10 degrees. And we decompose our anomalous Hall effect into the symmetric part and into anti-symmetric part. And what you see that in addition to this crystal Hall effect or normal Hall effect, you also see a prominent effect of canting. And that is the chiral Hall effect of ferromagnets. It appears perhaps to some of you as a surprising effect because here with canting, we don't really change the overall magnetization of our sample. And that's the beauty of chiral Hall effect and ferromagnets. Now in anti-ferromagnets, it is also present. Take a look, for example, at one monolayer of strontium ruthenate, uh, which is an anti-ferromagnetic collinear state, and it has all this octahedral tilting and rotation. And by the way, Libor tells me also rightfully that this is an, an example of an alter magnet. And let's take a look at the electronic structure of this material. We do the canting in the plane by plus minus five degrees, and the effect we basically don't see. However, when we look at the anomalous Hall effect, 
we see a gigantic variation of the anomalous Hall effect, which is obviously very chiral. So it is very positive for a negative angle and it is negative for a positive angle. And this manifests a colossal chiral Hall effect, which is very difficult to attribute to some sort of very small, almost vanishing magnetization in this sample. And actually, if you look in the literature, you will find several materials, antiferromagnetic materials, where this colossal chiral hole effect, as we call it, has been observed. You can also bring this separation into the realm of optics and so on. However, we also know that if we change the symmetry of our crystal, if we take, for example, a PT symmetric manganese 2 gold, which does not allow crystal hole effect in the collinear sense, we still observe a very pronounced chiral hole effect. For example, upon canting by two degrees, you can have hundreds of Siemens per centimeter in this material. Let's try to use now symmetry arguments to understand um, what is happening here and how can we make sense out of this, at first, maybe confusing separation into chiral and crystal Hall effect. And to do this first, we remember that anomalous Hall effect is odd on, under time reversal. Another thing is that in this simple system, we can introduce two order parameters. There is only two. That is N plus and N minus. One is the ferromagnetic magnetization. The other one is the staggered magnetization. Moreover, in this system, and this is an example of how you would do this for this general system, there is an operation of interchange between sites A and B. And this operation keeps the N plus intact while it changes the sign of N minus. And this suggests the following natural decomposition of your anomalous Hall effect into odd and even parts with respect to the interchange between the side A and B. And here what participates are these order parameters in different powers constructed so as to obey the symmetries of the anomalous Hall effect, time reversal and the oddity or evanicity um, in the other channel. Now from this decomposition, uh, another key step is to include the staggered nature of tensors, which arises upon the interchange of atoms to arrive at to the lowest order at these expressions for the odd and even parts of your anomalous whole conductivity. So as you see, these are very complicated expressions. So it is extremely difficult to say just by looking in five seconds, what will happen if I change the spins in this way or in that way. The normal ferromagnetic kind of anomalous Hall effect appears here as a small part. It is one term in the bunch of all of these other higher order contributions, which are even or odd with respect to the change of indices. Now, once you have such an expression, what you have to do is you have to try to rewrite it in terms of chirality. And in case of this honeycomb lattice, it is a simple task. Chirality, vector chirality between these two spins is easily expressible in terms of N minus and N plus. And if you do this three conceptual steps, you can provide a table for what can happen in terms of chirality for ferromagnets and antiferromagnets in different symmetry uh, of your crystal. If we start with inversely symmetric crystals, then it is only even part of the tensor which is allowed. In this case, for antiferromagnets, it is a purely chiral Hall effect it is directly sensitive to chirality. For ferromagnets, it is the normal, the crystal Hall effect. It includes the N plus, the conventional term, plus what we call the bichiral contributions, which are not sensitive to the sense of chirality. Now, when you break the inversion symmetry, you, you're also allowed to have odd tensors. And this comes with the chiral Hall effect for ferromagnets, the numerical simulation you have seen uh, in one of the first slides, and the crystal Hall effect of antiferromagnets if you start from antiferromagnetic state. It has the N minus as well as the bichiral term. Now, if you think about this categorization, then you realize that this part of the table is practically unexplored. We have basically not heard anything about chiral Hall effect in ferromagnets, and by now we know very little about crystal Hall effect in antiferromagnets. However, this part is seemingly more obvious because we know or we think that we understand crystals with inversion symmetry very well. Therefore, the appearance of something surprising would be kind of unexpected. 
However, one has to remember that when you do the symmetry expansions, this means that these coefficients here, they can be actually non-trivial and how complex they are is determined by the details of your crystal structure. So let's try to maybe illustrate the complexity of this interplay between crystal and chiral Hall effect. And we have been really lucky that the group of Badi Hassaf um, uh, contacted us last year uh, concerning their measurements on this celebrated or very well studied material, manganese bismuth telluride. Manganese bismuth telluride has layers of manganese atoms, which are antiferromagnetically coupled, which are separated by the spacer of bismuth and telluride atoms. Now, what our collaborators observed is that in the magnetic field, this material exhibits a transition from an antiferromagnetic state to a ferromagnetic state. And this goes via the effect of canting. So for example, for in the field of four Tesla, you have a slightly canted antiferromagnetic state. But in the field of eight Tesla, this changes and you have canted ferromagnetic state. The prediction of the symmetry analysis here predicts the following term, which appears on top of this normal anomalous Hall effect. And this falls directly into the realm of this categorization of this table that you see here. Take a look at this term carefully. So this N plus is the antiferromagnetic chirality for an antiferromagnet. So this gives you this part. When you're in the ferromagnetic state, the N minus is the ferromagnetic chirality and it is squared. It is the bichiral term for the ferromagnetic canted state. And in fact, you have to include this more complicated term to go smoothly through this transition from the chiral Hall effect in antiferromagnets to crystal Hall effect in the ferromagnetic state of this material. By including this term, you reproduce the behavior of your anomalous Hall effect in the magnetic field, which you cannot do without it. Moreover, it allows you to understand why the hell do you observe a very interesting scaling of your anomalous Hall effect with magnetization, which does not fall into this expected proportional to magnetization scaling like behavior that we expect from the anomalous Hall effect. And besides this kind of things which are useful, you can of course use this information about how the structure of the anomalous Hall effect that you have in the material that you have, how would it help you to read out the exact chirality of the state that you have. Because on the example of what you see, if you just used the normal laws or the normal Hall effects, you would be very much off in the estimation of the chirality of your state that you observe in your system. The chiral Hall effect is a different beast from the normal Hall effect. And this becomes very clear or apparent when you start looking at the origins of this effect. And for computational scientists or theoreticians, the origins means is that I try to calculate this effect in the simplest way possible. And for us, of course, it is the perturbation theory. So what we do or what one should do to calculate the chiral Hall effect expressed in terms of the electronic structure of uncanted material is to find some reference state which doesn't have the chirality which we are after add a small admixture of needed chirality and apply perturbation theory expressions so that you can actually calculate this chiral hole effects without any need for explicit calculations of canted states. It sounds like a hypothetical theoretical problem. Sure, it can be done, it's very interesting. But in, in fact, if you do this, you realize that there is a lot of physics in this procedure. Let's take a look at the two spin chiral hole effect that we have just discussed. And let's take a look at the perturbation of the Berry curvature of our K states, the anti-symmetric part of it with respect to the angle theta. If you do this properly, then you realize that your chiral Hall effect surprisingly has a very complicated structure. In addition to the normal Hall effect, which is given by the Berry curvature in K space, the chiral Hall effect also gives you a measure of how strong or how large your quantum metric tensor is in the system. And this is something the normal Hall effect does not give you information about of any kind. The third term or the third beast is the so-called the information about the mixed curvature um, of your geometric states in, in, in the solid. And it, the relation to this one is in particularly 
kind of intuitive and understandable because this is the term which we call the staggered mixed Berry curvature term. And it arises due to coupling of electronic motion and the process of staggered canting of your spins, be that antiferromagnetic canting or ferromagnetic canting. This Berry curvature of this kind is directly proportional to the staggered spin orbit torques that the electric field would exert on your system and do the canting. Not the coherent rotation as usual, but rather the canting. And in fact, the relation between the two, you can justify by explicit calculations. Here is manganese to gold, and here is the distribution of the chiral hole effect in the system uh, for small canting angle of two degrees and minus two degrees, I think plotted against the magnitude of staggered spin orbit torque under the application of electric field resolved in the vicinity of the same bands. And you see that there is basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. That means, and this is intuitive, that when you can't, you get the anomalous Hall effect. And therefore the process of canting has to be related to it. It also gives us an idea that the chiral Hall effect can appear as a nonlinear contribution to the Hall effect. And understand this is also simple. You use one electric field to can the spins and you use the second electric field to drive the chiral Hall effect through the system. So perhaps this is another thing to look um, in your experiments when you're trying to uh, find out what is the effect of canting on the anomalous Hall effect. This all sounds very nice, uh, but you might ask a question of what about more complicated systems? So this was a very simple test system of two atoms on the honey complex. Okay, um, I will consider a more complicated case and I will use it to suggest how in general this decomposition can be done. Let's take a look at manganese 3X compounds, which are very popular compounds where X is normally germanium or, or tin. And these are layers of Kagome magnetic planes where the spins within each triangle are oriented by 120 degrees with respect to each other. So if you look along the 111 axis, that's how this lattice looks in the plane, we call it X, Y. And in principle, several states here are possible. And the separation between them is done by two flavors of chirality. The first flavor is the normal vector chirality. It tells you the sense of canting between the spins when you go around the Z axis. The second one, and this gives you a freedom of a rotation of the overall structure. It, it is fixed, but you can rotate the spins by a constant angle. And this is corresponding to what we call octopolar chirality. And this is from, from works um, uh, which are shown here. Um, as I said, I denoted here to emphasize the chirality character as a double product vector product between spins because Chirality then is in here. First, you fix the chirality between two spins, and then you use the third spin to drag this chirality kind of around in your structure. Now, what would we do here? It seems to be very complicated, so many chiralities and so on. And the key step, symmetry-wise here, is the following. Um, what we do is first, we construct a space of possible magnetic states in the system. And here, the key ingredient again is the transpositions between different spins on different atoms. Then we establish the symmetry properties of our expected anomalous hole conductivity vector, which in this case has to belong to T1G reducible representation. And after that, we use Schur's lemma to construct the projectors in the spin space, which give us the proper irreducible representations of the symmetry group. And if you do this, you end up with this very nice expression for your anomalous hole conductivity vector or anomalous hole conductivity tensor, as you wish. Um, obviously, um, it includes, at least to this order in spin, it includes the anomalous hole effect part, which is the normal part, and which is obviously sensitive only to the overall net magnetization in the system. The second part is what we call ad hoc the chiral hole effect, because here the structure looks more complicated. And the general recipe here is that if you do something like this for a material that you have, it is your job to try to present it in terms of chiralities that you want to see, or you have to project these expressions onto the chiralities that you're interested in.
In our particular case, I have suggested these two chiralities, vector and octopolar, as two possible ways. And I can arrive at this nice representation that, for example, my sigma xy is zero for chirality minus one, and it is non-zero for vector chirality plus one. And within this chirality state, we have an additional chiral contribution, which is directly sensitive to the octopolar chirality. You can compare this, for example, to ab initio calculations, and you find that this actually gives a very good fit to your ab initio data, from which you can extract the magnitude of these coefficients, which you have in your expansion of conductivity in terms of spins. That is nice, because then you can go to an experimentalist, and you can try to read out the state in which the system is experimentally via looking at the behavior of the anomalous Hall effect. That is practical side of it. Conceptually, however, let's take a look at this expression carefully. And let's do the following. Let's fix all the spins that we have here. And we take only one spin and we start changing its direction. The anomalous Hall effect will change in some way, right? But this gives you an idea. Okay, so perhaps I can interpret this contribution as the local contribution of this spin to my particular anomalous Hall effect. It gives us an idea that we can have some more complicated local structure of our transport properties that we're looking at. And that's the line of thought. That's a conceptual viewpoint with which I try to demonstrate that chirality of this kind can be also relevant for non-magnetic systems even before going to magnetic systems. Let's take a look at a non-magnetic crystal and let's apply an electric field to it. Let's say we take a cubic lattice. So we have electric field along Y, we have a current, which is the spin current, and we know this is the spin hall effect, which is along this axis. Now the polarization, we all know this, has to be along this axis, the polarization of the, of the spin current, the spin polarization. So it doesn't matter whether I come with gigantic electrode and I harvest all these all this uniform spins, or I just look with atomically small electrode, um, like STM tip, and they probe the spin polarization of the current there. It doesn't matter. The reason for this are the symmetry properties of my spin current. Now, if I write down, the spin current density for the spin hole effect. It is a complicated beast. It lives in a six dimensional space and it is constructed from the spin hole conductivity, which couples the electric field direction, the direction of spin polarization of my spin current and the direction of the propagation of the spin current. And the crystal symmetries enter here. They tell you what couples to what, what is possible. And you can show, and we have showed it more than 10 years ago, that in a cubic crystal, you can have only one direction of spin polarization in this simple setup. And moreover, in cubic crystals, the same crystal symmetry kills the anisotropy of the spin hole effect that you could have. However, let's think a little bit beyond in terms of, of this expansion that we did for manganese 3 germanium. Let's imagine that we can allow for hidden structure of spin currents. And by hidden structure of spin currents, I simply mean that in addition to this spin current density, I add one more dependence. I add one more, more tensor, which stands for the atomic side or the region around some atom on which I sit. And now, the crystal symmetry will enter into this more complicated local spin hole conductivity tensor. And what we are trying to achieve here is to loosen this condition on the constant spin polarization of the spin hole current in space that we normally assume in spintronics. We are aiming at something like this, where if we look here with the detector here, we will see one spin polarization. If we look here, it could be different. And if we look wherever we want, depends on the lattice, how many of the sides we can have, then we hope to see something of this kind. And the funny thing is that the symmetry actually allows or it favors the side dependent spin current polarization. And if we take a look at the non-magnetic, I emphasize lattice of manganese three germanium or tin, we apply electric field along Y and we look at the spin current along X. Then we will see that actually, the symmetry wants to have some sort of chiral arrangement of local spin polarizations of this kind, which is plotted here. 
To quantify the strength of this effect, I construct what I call a chiral spin operator, which takes into account these local directions. I then construct the chiral current operator, which is constructed in the normal way. And I apply the Kubo formalism for response to calculate this chiral spin hole effect. And I can calculate it for time binding model of manganese three X structure, this is the band structure. And indeed I observe some strong response of my chiral spin currents in the system. I generalize also the notion of chiral spin barrier curvature. And I see that it is non-zero around the states which allow for this non-trivial chiral spin coupling. And this we think is extremely exciting because this adds an additional dimension to all these studies of spin hole effect in low symmetric crystals that we have been looking at, but perhaps we have not been looking at them too carefully, or we just didn't know how to design experiments in a proper way. But one of the key applications here could be due to the understanding that these chiral spin currents can couple to chiral spin texture. So what I do now, is I take this non-magnetic lattice structure of manganese three, whatever, and I assume that it has magnetic structure, which it has. And I see whether these couples, so the, the spins which, which I have propagating in my crystal can couple to this local spin structure. If I take a look at the surface of manganese three X, then the chiral spin currents will accumulate at the surface and they will lead to what we call an anomalous torque. And here I will call it the chiral torque due to the chiral nature of this direction, which enters through the chiral spin operator. What I do next is I investigate what would be a possible impact of this chiral torque on the dynamics of my structure. And for this, I use the LLG dynamics. So this includes an external magnetic field, which we don't need uh, in these calculations here, uh, thermal fluctuations, damping, and this chiral torque. And here you see the result of simulations that we have run, more simulations, more details you can find in the paper that is uh, at the title of this slide. But what you see here is that if you have a crystal of certain chirality, these red spins and red, you apply the chiral torque and you immediately observe a switching of your octuplar chirality from state plus one to the state of minus one. This you can see also from this plot where we plot this octuplar chirality. And we predict the switching on the scale of 100 picoseconds. And the switching is kind of deterministic and it is different from previous mechanisms of switching that we, we had, for example, in these works where it is mainly due to the generation of this uniform spin current in, for example, platinum, which is when injected into our uh, chiral spin structure causes an effect of switching. Now notice that here for the spin currents, I didn't include into consideration the complexity, which comes with higher order contributions due to spin order. And this is something which is probably very exciting to address and study in the future. This gives you a possibility to have a very complex structure of the local spin currents that you can have uh, even in trivial materials. Let me now switch. This is the second part of the talk. Um, I switch now to smooth textures and I just want to make the, it clear that all these things about chirality that we have talked about by now are also relevant for smooth textures such as skirmions. This have to be for these assumptions and uh, expressions that you will see, these have to be very smooth textures where the gradients of the magnetization are well defined. Now in such a texture of a given texture by this vector n, we do via the so-called gradient expansion technique or, or philosophy, which tells us that the conductivity of the overall texture is some sort of average of local conductivities, again, local, which is comprising the collinear normal terms, the ferromagnetic terms. And we consider only ferromagnetic terms here. If you want to consider anti-ferromagnetic experiments, for example, then you have to expand it in terms of gradients of N plus and N minus as we did in the beginning of the talk. And it also includes the chiral term. That's the highest in the expansion term with respect to gradients of your magnetization. That's the perturbation theory to you, if you wish. Now, the collinear terms, we understand very well. That's the anomalous Hall effect. And what we are after here is showing that the chiral terms can also exist. And again, we heavily rely on the symmetry, on Zaga relation, time reversal, and the crystal symmetry. And here we assume it is again a honeycomb lattice because we have chosen it as a guinea pig in this talk. 
using the crystal structure, we can actually we can represent our conductivity as a sum of contributions onto different irreducible representations. There are three in this situation, A1, A2, and E2 for honeycomb lattice, which has C6V point group symmetry. If you write them down, since you know how the properties of your magnetization and its gradients behave to which representation they belong, you can easily cook up the terms which contribute, for example, to sigma A1. This is the term which corresponds to magnetoconductivity. And in addition to normal magnetoconductivity and anisotropic magnetoconductivity, we have the chiral magnetoconductivity term proportional to the gradient. The term which is corresponding to the E2 irreducible representation is the one which is the planar hole effect guy. It has the normal planar hole effect in it as a collinear part, but it also has a chiral part which is sensitive to the gradients of magnetization. That's the chiral planar Hall effect. And finally, the A2 part is the anomalous Hall effect. And here we see our old friend, the ferromagnetic anomalous Hall effect, in addition to this chiral term, which following the philosophy that we have been pursuing for now, we call the chiral Hall effect. If you have a full grasp onto the symmetry of your system, you can easily come up with tables of such scale where you can categorize all your effects up to whatever order in magnetization gradient that you want uh, under a given irreducible representation. And if you have, for example, some specific texture in mind, such as a spin spiral state with the direction of propagation Q and the pitch of two pi over Q, then you can substitute it into those expressions that you saw. And then you can put clicks where the effect has to happen and empty, you see where the effect does not occur. Now, what we also did is we wanted to prove that this actually works, and this is a sensible thing to do, because as I said, this all relies on the gradient expansion, which, which assumes that the texture is very smooth. So what we do is we evaluate the corresponding components of the conductivity tensor explicitly using Kubo formalism, and using supercells up to 2,000 atoms in it using different disorder and so on. And to distinguish between chiral and non-chiral effects, we do these calculations for plus Q spirals and for minus Q spirals, and we subtract and add, do the symmetrization and the symmetrization that we have talked about in slide number four. And you can do this, and you can confirm, indeed, that all these conclusions of the gradient expansion um, conceptualizing, we're actually correct. Moreover, doing these explicit calculations gives you a chance to look a little bit deeper into what happens, for example, to chiral magnetoconductivity or chiral planar Hall effect or chiral Hall effect as a function of your electronic structure, such as band feeding or the pitch of your spin spiral for different types of spirals, nail, blow, or cold. What you see, and this strikes you immediately, is that the structure of these chiral terms is much richer than the structure of corresponding non-chiral terms. In terms of the chiral planar Hall effect for Bloch spirals, it is the only contribution. There is no non-chiral contribution. What you see there is purely chiral. Moreover, you can also check how important the Berry phase physics is for these effects, and you indeed find that the chiral Hall effect is prominently a Berry phase kind of phenomenon. You can also look at the magnitude and you see that the magnetoconductivity, for instance, for this system is 10 times smaller than the normal magnetoconductivity, but the chiral Hall effect is really reaches the scale of the normal anomalous um, Hall effect in the system. And once you have done these calculations, you can extract these coefficients that you have seen to estimate how strong the impact of this chiral signal has to be, for example, on the skirmion which if we assume, for instance, a Swiss knife approximation to it. And this gives you a feeling of how important these effects could be in your particular material. And then you can allow yourself to go to an experimentalist and say, look, I think this is not topological Hall effect, but this is what, what is a chiral Hall effect. You don't have to do these calculations of supercells, but you can do something which is in the spirit of perturbation theory for the collinear host. 
This is known as the gradient expansion technique applied to the Green's functions. And for example, you can try to expand your lesser green function, which gives you transport properties in terms of the gradients of magnetization. And here, of course, everything is clear. Anomalous Hall effect is the term non-sensitive to um, um, gradients of N. Chiral Hall effect is the first one. Topological Hall effect is the second one. And it has also many terms which have uh, two gradients of your magnetization. What is nice is that you can actually calculate then um, the chiral hole response for any given magnetization texture if you know the electronic structure of this material. And when you do this, you realize, that's what we did at least, that this chiral hole effect is prominent not only for scorpions, but for very generic incomprehensible structures which arise at the phase boundaries um, uh, for your materials that you study. And therefore, we think it is possibly observed in many systems and it is also wrongfully interpreted in many cases as the topological Hall effect. A brief slide, I have to show it because once we were doing this, uh, we actually discovered a whole stream of um, other things which relate the transporting textures to the ideas of non-commutative geometry, which were prominent uh, in nuclear physics, string theory, in the theories of quantum Hall effect, and generally whatever requires non-commutative gauge theories. What we realized here is that you can see textures as some sort of objects in the complicated phase space, which is non-commutative due to the fact that your Hamiltonian is dependent both on K and on the position in this Kermian. But this non-commutative language allows you to represent, for example, the response, the, the transport properties in a very compact and a very intuitive non-commutative way. And it also allows you to promote or find out what is the role of this non-commutative berry phases um, uh, that seem to be important for the physics here. And overall, we can also postulate that we find that the gauge theory of skirmions is pretty much um, similar to the treatment of, of gauge theory uh, within the string theory, which is uh, something one has to talk um, uh, completely separately from this presentation about, but it's very exciting stuff. Okay, so I reached the last part of my talk and um, I have talked a lot about chirality in canted systems and in frustrated systems. And I also talked about chirality of spin spirals. And what I try to do now is I try to imagine that we have a system and we take it out of equilibrium. And how we take it out of equilibrium, we increase the temperature. And when we do this, we excite magnets or spin waves. And you can envisage simple spin wave or a magnet in this way. This is uh, the picture taken from Wikipedia by the way. And when you look at this guy, it is completely clear to you that there have to be situations in which this excitation carries some chirality and it can generate some chiral effects that we have been discussing. And to see that this is true, you actually don't have to do a lot of hard work. You have to take a speed model, for instance, model given by spin Hamiltonian here. It has Heisenberg exchange. It is important that he, it has DMI, or coupling to a magnetic field, one of the two is necessary. And you can take the operator of chirality. And for an example here, I take scalar chirality and express it in terms of these bosonic operators. And this gives you an opportunity to estimate how strong the chirality carried by a single magnon is given a specific magnonic state. So here you see the magnonic, magnonic structure, band structure, of a ferromagnetic Kagomi lattice. And what you see is that, first of all, there is some chirality carried by single magnons. And second, you see is that it is very sensitive to the topological sense of your states that you see. So here with numbers are indicated the churn numbers of your magnonic bands. And indeed, this is a rather general finding. And you can also find it in um, non-collinear Kaplaner magnets. So here you see manganese 3 germanium. You see that the magnetic excitations there carry some sort of out of plane scalar chirality in them intrinsically. You can then increase the temperature and start populating the magnets, and you realize that you can actually kind of imprint chirality into your system by increasing the temperature in it. And the properties of this chirality you can control by the parameter of your model, by the material parameters that you have. But that means that whenever you have a fluctuating magnet, uh, 
all these topological chiral electronic effects that we have been discussing, they are probably there. And this makes chirality relevant for you, even if you never would think that it is. And perhaps this is also something to keep in mind. And uh, to show how this can work or what this can impact, I give two examples. Um, and I refer here to the orbital magnetism of electrons, not the whole effect. And the two are actually related very closely. If you look at the orbital magnetism of electronic systems, which are chiral, you will find that it also can be decomposed into all these chiral and topological terms and so on. And here I take the topological part of orbital magnetization, electronic orbital magnetization, which arises as a result of an effect of a giant effective field that this electron, which hops between these nonlinear atoms feels. The orbital moment of such an electron is directly proportional to the chirality, in this case, color chirality, and the constant of proportionality exists. It is some material parameter. And this is not some um, fancy exotic phenomenon. Uh, you can convince yourself very easily in that it exists by taking this model uh, of ferromagnetic Kagomi lattice that we have been studying before and start counting the spins here out of the plane, thereby generating the chirality. And then you look at the orbital magnetism in your system, observing that it actually behaves in a very chiral way. And from these values, you can estimate the magnitude of your electronic response. So from these calculations, you see that if we have chirality, if it's carried by a magnon, a magnon has to generate an orbital moment in your system. And um, how large can it be? How important this effect can be? And um, Hiro, I just have uh, two more slides, so this is maybe five more minutes. And following the motivation of our experimental colleagues, um, driven by the group of Wei Zhang and Peng Li, we took a look at this copper 13 BDC um, uh, incomprehensible name compound, which is a prototype topological insulator in the realm of magnets. And if you look at the orbital magnetization here, you see that it is there. And you can also study it as a function of temperature and as a function of applied magnetic field. What you see that there is no effect for in-plane field, but there is a large effect. There is increasing orbital moment for out-of-plane magnetic field. So magnets seem to mediate this out-of-plane orbital moment with increasing temperature. It is a small moment, so it is difficult to observe it by explicit measurements of uh, magnetization. However, we know that there is a quantity which correlates very strongly with orbital magnetism, and that is the spectroscopic G factor. And here in the behavior, from the behavior of G factor, you can extract what is the behavior of your orbital moment. The prediction of our theory is that for the out of plane field, our G factor has to increase with temperature which is in contrast to common wisdom of the behavior of G factor, which is normally either staying constant or decaying as a function of temperature as we kill off the spin orbit energy scale. And in fact, this is exactly what our collaborators see. They see a rapid increase of out of plane G factor with temperature, which seems to be consistent uh, with this magnonic mediation of the orbital magnetism. Finally, if you have this orbital magnetism, you can also use the properties of magnons that if you apply a temperature gradient, you can scatter magnons in transverse direction and you can inject chirality into a different part of your sample. And this chirality will also drag with it the orbital electronic magnetism. And we have estimated this effect in a, in a simple model using this um, uh, linear response expression, which takes into account the magnitude of transverse scattering of magnons. And you can realize that this magnonic transport of orbital angular momentum can be very prominent. It is certainly a competitor to the magnon Nernst effect, but it is also a marker of topology. And this is on the background of the recent interest that the community has in the transport of orbital angular momentum of electrons for different practical purposes. Now, what I'm not going to talk about is about the ways that we can generate chirality in an educated way by laser excitations. And this is also a completely different stream of research. One should probably talk separately about it, where we use chiral coherent electronic excitations to generate chiral interactions out of equilibrium, which allow you generation of such spin spirals or any sort of chiral structures that you can desire. 
here I come to the conclusion. Um, so if you have to remember something from this talk, it is that we can try to bring sense into the behavior of whole effects, transport phenomena, orbital magnetism, um, with respect to non-collinearity in our systems. And this goes via the notion of chiral currents, um, which I try to promote here, uh, ending up with suggesting a new concept of chiral spin currents, which I think is something very new, something to be um, studied in the, in the future. And these chiral currents, they can also have a profound impact on chirality switching or dynamics. They're intrinsically related to internal dynamics of magnetization that we have in response to currents. And moreover, the third message is that beware that out of equilibrium, all these effects can be prominent or important, even for collinear at zero temperature magnets. And this culminates in the observation that you can generate educated chirality or generated in an educated way by laser excitations, even in non-chiral systems. I would like to thank here the key people, finally. Uh, so that's Fabian Lux, Dongguk Go, Sumit Gosh, Helen, Jonathan, and Li Chuan, as well as a bunch of our guys from Ulich and from Mainz for kind of providing me uh, with this exciting um, findings. And um, our external collaborators are also listed here for this talk, a small amount. And I, of course, thank the funding which made it ha happen. But most of all, I thank you for listening to this talk um, and maybe asking interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, very well. Um, this, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. And, uh, and Thanks, Hiro. At uh, all this uh, exciting, uh, extensions of looking at chirality and uh, the other crystal effects. Mm -hmm. um, so we have plenty of questions, I think. Uh, let's start uh, uh, oh, with Igor, I think. Uh, let me promote him. Sorry, let me first promote Igor there. And then uh, there's also another question by a uh, comment by Shanguk. Let me give you. So Shanguk, maybe you can ask your first question or... or uh, I think I'll let you talk. Shanguk, uh, can you... Uh, no, okay, sure. that's not Sangu. Okay, okay. okay. Sangu okay. first and then Igor. Okay. Yeah, so that's me, right? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Very, very interesting. Thank uh, you. Two questions I have. One is uh, uh, you briefly showed this uh, uh, European titanium O3 as well as uh, calcium sodium manganese bismuth 2, other people's work. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, do they see anomalous whole effect on those? Uh, they see the anomalous Hall effect upon canting. So they apply the magnetic field. And I don't remember which one, um, which one of these works. It could be the Europium titanate, um, where they also construct a model for why canting would lead to anomalous Hall effect. So it is because... I, I, I think in, in general field, I, in general field, probably there is no magnetism, European case. Um, I would have to check. Only in, oh, probably only in magnetic. Okay, that's fine. It's not your work. So let me uh, just go to your, uh, your, uh, your topic. So okay. uh, as you probably know, all these, uh, let's say, manganese three X compounds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they all belong to so-called ferromagnetic uh, point group. You know, magnetic point group is always a ferromagnetic point group. So that even though it's very small, they always show very small uh, net ferromagnetic moment, non-zero magnetic moment. They always always show that because they basically because uh, they belong to ferromagnetic uh, point group. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, now, so uh, the, the question to you is: uh, uh, you discussed about this the so-called chirality switching. Uh, yep. The term chirality can mean many different things, uh, but sure. when you have this chirality switching, what really switches is the uh, scalar chirality? No, is so what, no, what switches is this. So, in this particular um, simulations, so as I said, when you add spin structure into account, there could be some other effects. But here, what switches is you don't see my screen, do you? Just a second. No. No, that's okay. You can just uh, uh, turn no, no. So it is. It is this octuplar chirality that we talk about. Yeah? So oh, I see. 
if you think about it, it is the magnetization in the plane. So it corresponds to order parameter, which is like a ferromagnetic magnetization in the plane. Oh, I see. So, so, so that so that means so when you have a character switching in this magnetic X compounds, yeah, you also do switch the net ferromagnetic moment. Uh, not the out of plane one, and no, we no, don't have to yeah, in plane in plane. In plane, in plane one, but of course we, we don't have it. So we, 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 we kill it, but that's the chirality which corresponds. Um, so I think it's, it's easier if you see this expression for chirality. So you take spin S1 and then you rotate this spin S2 by 120 degrees, you add it, and then you rotate by 100. So uh, it is not really magnetization, but it is, um, it is magnetization like. Perhaps make a, but, maybe can make a comment. But he played uh, the other Samu, Samu, maybe I can make a comment. Because I think uh, yes. uh, relating to what you were driving at, uh, just maybe from the intuition point of view, we always thought, okay, if you are in the ferromagnetic group, that means you are have the, you can have a pseudo vector as your uh, a linear pseudo vector. And we know that anomalous Hall effect, the anomalous conductivity or Hall conductivity is effectively a pseudo vector. Now, in a ferromagnet, uh, typically we are intuitively shown for a long time to believe that this pseudo vector of the whole conductivity or the whole uh, vector or pseudo vector is uh, proportional to the perpendicular component of the magnetization. Mm -hmm. What Yuri is showing you, and this we also showed in the crystal hole effect, that the fact that by symmetry you need to be in this point group to have a, a whole effect or anomalous whole effect. The proportionality of what the contribution is to the magnetization or other, uh, in this case, the octopolar chirality. In our case, the chirality of the of the of the crystal non-magnetic environment is different. They don't have to be, you know. Many people have the, the false intuition that you have to have a finite magnetization to actually have a anomalous Hall effect. Mm -hmm. You just need to be in that point group and other things can give you that contribution even if you actually go to the limit of zero counting. Yeah, okay. Understand? I, that's, that's, not, that's one of the things that I think is, is driving that in terms of the possible confusion. And this is what yeah. they no, that's theory was actually putting that's, together this differentiation between what he calls the a normal anomalous Hall effect, which is the proportional to the magnetization perpendicular mm -hmm. of plane, yeah. and the rest of them that actually are coming uh, that would be allowed by symmetry, of course, uh, but the, nothing really says that symmetry, that the proportionality of the non, the weak magnetization and the anomalous Hall effect is there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. But, uh, uh, very clear. I, 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 I do uh, follow that. Even though okay. I'm a theorist, uh, I'm experimentalist, but I do yeah. follow you. However, yeah. however, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, in terms of symmetry requirement, I'm not sure whether it has to be ferromagnetic uh, so, uh, uh, point group in order to have in order to have off diagonal component. So maybe it's, so. What you see here is that there is also a strong fluctuation of octopole octopolar moments um, when you when you do the switching. Yeah, but you see that the z component is actually always kind of zero. And the Z component is the one which gives you the out of plane magnetization. So but you do have also in plane. You do have also in plane component. Oh, said, uh, right. Uh, um, well, yes, yeah. you yes, you do. You yes, can you do. have in plane. You have in plane components. Yes. Yes. But so not, whether that switches or not, that was my question. So it doesn't have to be. So uh, maybe Don Gook can also comment. He did. Uh, uh, simulations of this, and Dongbu, do you think that the in-plane magnetization plays a key role in this LLG magnetization? Uh, yes, I, I can have some comments here. So, so this in this compound, microscopically, it is known that there is very weak magnetic moments, and probably a lot of people might think that weak magnetic moment couples to uh, this uniform spin current. But uh, we, what we found is this is not the driving force of the switching. What actually drives is the, the spin current, which is locally non-collinear. And even though there is no net magnetic moment, it can locally couple to in a site no, dependent no, that way. I understand. No, right. I understand. That was not my question. My question is, uh, you know, the dominant effect is kind of a you know bulk with this non-collinear effect that I understand. All right. But when you switch that, whether mm -hmm. this net moment follows that or not, that was my question. 
Ah, I, okay, that's a good question. The, in, in this compound, there's a weak magnetic moment. And this is indeed uh, in the direction of what people call octopolar moments. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but, but by symmetry, yeah, it, it follows. Yeah, by but, symmetry, it should follow. That, that yeah, was it, my question. Exactly. My but I, I okay, want to emphasize that this uh, weak magnetic moment is too small to explain this switching. No, no, no. I understand. That was not yeah. my question. That's okay. not my question. It was you know? a, that's a handle on the octopole. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Okay. He wants to do that it. makes sense. Okay. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so then Igor, then Peter, then uh, Vidal, yeah, and then Helen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very short comment and a bit longer question. The short comment is that uh, there is a tiny misconception that this alter magnetic Hall effect, which I'm, I don't want to use this misleading uh, nomenclature as crystal Hall effect, but alter magnetic is good, uh, does not require low symmetry. It does require particular symmetry, but it can happen even in cubic symmetry. We know now about cubic alter magnets. Uh -huh. uh, but um, more important question is uh, regarding your fluctuation theory, which is very nice microscopic theory. Uh, but I, I'm curious, is that you, you may or may not know about our work, which was partly experimental on yttrium manganese 6, tin 6, mm -hmm. uh, where I was responsible for theory. And we had, um, we had sort of uh, phenomenological theory, which was based on the fact that uh, the system is three-dimensional, and if you have a particular spiral in the third dimension, that mm -hmm. even a simple non chiral magnet can create um, a net chir chirality if you change population. So I wonder if your uh, theory can be applied to this case microscopically. I think, I think certainly, yes. So I, I think I wrote you an email uh, about this, right? Uh, no, no so. that person who wrote you an email about this was me. Let's put it like this. <laughs> and uh, so I think the theory can be applied almost one to one. I agree. So maybe perhaps we could take a look at it. I mean, this just for fun. But concerning this alter, alter magnetic anomalous Hall effect, I have to admit that this table that I showed, it was specifically designed for Rajba systems. Yeah, so it is, it is, so it, it indeed can become more complicated depending on your crystal symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, basically, that what uh, this uh, beautiful work by Libor and collaborator, which outlined this all symmetry requirement, it clearly shows that you can have literally any single in any um, yes, number of but, symmetry operations. Yes, but all of this can be categorized. So I can tell you which symmetry can give you what kind of contribution to anomalous Hall effect. Or in terms of chirality between spins or not even chirality, different order parameters. Because the more spins you have, the more order parameters you have. Uh -huh. So Great. this is all Fabian uh, is responsible. He, he has a program which is able to analyze this actually. Very good. Thank if you. anyone is interested in the audience as well. We'll get Fabian to do it. <laughs> uh, uh, Peter, uh, maybe you are, can go next. Yes, uh, it was a beautiful talk, uh, Yuri. Uh, we, um, a lot of material and many things uh, that we can learn from you. I was uh, wondering about the chirality switching. Uh, it was your slide 16 and then 17. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. You can, you can show your, it through. your screen again, please. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, no. So it is related to how you model the switching. Okay. Um, yeah. see, uh, yes, maybe it was in the. On, okay. Yes, we, we can look at it. Um, let's go to the one with. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. We can, we can start from this. It's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because here you have you have actually two things that can lead to the switching. Here you you use uh, the, the the torque in the form that is given there, which comes from kind of Stronchevsky torque. Uh, but you have you have a spin current and you have a spin accumulation on the atom. Uh -huh. And the question is how to use both of them, because a few slides back there is a spin current. Yeah. yeah. And as right. you said, as you said correctly, the spin current is depending on the, on the atom, and that is an interesting property. But uh -huh. but if you look at the torques, yeah, if there is a local spin accumulation on the atom, yeah. yeah. Then it will also enter your that equation. Is, that is certainly correct, Peter. Yeah. Um, we did not include it here for clarity okay. because the relative magnitude of the two can vary. 
right? Okay. So it is the same like, you know, in normal, in normal spin orbit torque switching. You have spin hole effect of platinum, which gives you some spin injection uh, into the interface. And you also have a spin accumulation, which can yeah. have different properties depending on the symmetry of your interface and what you have there, what not. And it is the interplay between the two which determines the details of how things okay, go. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, so we did it. Yeah. yeah. But it, it then also means that what you show in on 17, it can still be different uh, because uh, there would be another con contribution possible. Yes, yes. Okay. no, this is certainly something to study. And uh, also, as I, I emphasize it again here, we didn't, we didn't consider the magnetic contributions mm -hmm. to, the, to this uh, local spin hole effect. Yeah, okay. so this is also something which which uh, which is uh, I I think we just kind of scratched on the surface of this, uh, yeah. Yeah. but we had to present it in a shape of a paper, so we had to do simulations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, Vaida uh, Vu, if you can. Uh, yes, can you hear me? How, how do you pronounce your name? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Vaida. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for very nice for the for the very nice talk. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a lot for me to to learn, but I will watch the YouTube later. Anyway, um, so I just want to clarify maybe um, uh, because I maybe I missed the, the point. So you mentioned there's a chiral Hall effect right due to the chirality of the spin structure, and there's also um, what we used to know maybe topological Hall effect due to the non coplanar spin structure, right? So uh, what I didn't quite get, it, maybe you already mentioned, but I didn't quite get it, is, that, is are these two different or maybe there's some contribution from chiral Hall effect to the what we used to believe the topological Hall effect? And then if so, if there are difference, then um, how do we expandly distinguish these two uh, contributions? Very good question. Um, I have a backup slide for this actually. Um... Just a second, share PowerPoint presentation. So first of all, the chiral Hall effect so I think it is most visible here. So the, the, the chiral Hall effect appears as this guy and the topological Hall effect is among many terms that you can have here. One of these chirality terms uh, that you talk about in terms of scalar chiralities is on, on, only one possible contribution that you can have. And uh, I think actually you can look at this nice paper by uh, Boaziz, Blugel and co-workers which analyze mm -hmm. the, this part in detail. And they show that there is more contributions to Hall effect here. Um, so they are def def definitely distinguishable. However, you can also do kind of um, estimates. So let me find the slide. If I do this quickly enough, um, this one. Um, so imagine you have a hand on, on your chiral Hall effect and your topological Hall effect. You know which coefficients correspond to them. Then you can, in principle, knowing the texture, you can find out what is the contribution of a skirmion which was placed in, in, in place of a, of a ferromagnetic background. So if I have ferromagnetic background and I subtract the skirmion contribution, this can be expressed in terms of chiral and topological terms. So to the first order, these guys are chiral. The topological ones appear as one over omega square contributions where omega is the size of the skirmions. So if you can change the size of skirmions and analyze the anomalous Hall effect from this, mm -hmm. you can probably mm -hmm. say something. Uh, you can clearly, or not clearly, I mean, depending what kind of data you have, uh, but you could uh, clearly separate the two. Yeah. And see, sorry. Way, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Another way is to try to switch the chirality of your skirmions. So, for example, here you see a calculation of a skirmion lattice and you see a cut. It's like a spin spiral propagating in one direction, right? So, imagine the skirmion lattice is a superposition of three Q states. And depending on the chirality of this, this core of your electron, the sign or the behavior of the chiral Hall effect may switch sign. Yeah? So if you can control this by some material parameter, then you can also clearly see the fingerprint of the chiral Hall effect. But this requires, all of this requires um, well-engineered experiments. Yeah? I see. But, so but so I believe it's not that, yeah. 
But I believe Clear. that in this in this data of on skirmions, when you see there is ferromagnetic curve and there is the dip due to topological Hall effect, that in many cases it is the chiral Hall effect and not the topological Hall effect. Yeah. So that's uh, that's what we believe mm -hmm. from from our simulations, at least. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And then uh, Helen, uh, can you please ask a question? Uh, yeah, with great pleasure. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Uh, so my question is very naive. Uh, as far as I learned from you, these um, uh, whole effects, these all types of chiral and uh, so on, can be observed either in uh, atomistically chiral uh, textures or in the smooth textures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually in... in uh, in reality, we are working with uh, materials which uh, always have a kind of uh, domain wall junctions or something like this. So you do not need to have a skirmion in order to have a kind of vertex structure, for example, Absolutely. in antiferromagnet. Yes. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, can we uh, disentangle uh, this macroscopic contribution from a microscopic? Because of, I have a feeling that they are of the same order of value. Or I'm uh, not right. Um, that's a good question, but I think that if you have a complicated system like an antiferromagnet, as I said, yeah, you have n plus, you have n minus, and if you keep track of variations of both in real space, you can kind of have interplay between n plus and n minus, which is the chirality in a way, which is local. And the gradients of them, which is more phenomenological, like which is the smooth or continuous theory. And I think you would be able to couple both. I, I suppose this would be possible. Maybe Fabian wants to comment on this just to give you a word. Uh, did you consider something like this in your symmetry analysis of super complicated uh, materials? So I mean, when I understand correctly, it's like these two regimes where where this uh, atomistic picture meets kind of this uh, smooth picture, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, this has also been partially analyzed by by Juba, yeah, by Juba Boazis in collaboration with uh, with Stefan Plügel in this paper that Yuri mentioned, um, because you can you can basically also derive these kind of smooth limit coefficients from this atomistic picture. So there is like a um, there is like a way in in which you can derive these coefficients that we calculate from the gradient expansion also like from this atomistic case but where you consider only very very smooth uh, very small canting between neighboring atoms but, but can, i, I can think that through. that you apply smooth theory to a black box and into the black box you can throw what you want so you can throw in all chiralities that you want in terms of uh, different order parameters yeah and uh, I think it is possible to combine two into a single symmetry justified object, which obeys certain rules of crystallographic symmetry. No? I, would say, I would put it in an in opposite way. If uh, Matthias makes an experiment, he does not know what he measures. Oh, I mean, he knows what he measures, but uh, he, he is usually working with uh, macroscopic samples. And when he sees some effect, should we uh, talk about microscopic origin or we can attribute it uh, to the sample structure? I mean, um, so if we take an example, this, this horrible ferrites that Matthias is normally measuring, which uh, I don't know why would anyone measure this uh, stuff. It's so complicated. Because it's, and, the, it's the first one to be observed, my boy. It appeared from Greek. It's, it's a pity Matthias is not here to defend this horrible <laughs> research. No, <laughs> um, But there we already don't, I mean, there is a lot of complexity on the level of a collinear, I mean, not collinear, but structure which has no domain walls, right? So, but from symmetry considerations, we can distinguish from which possible symmetry channel this contribution comes. And when we impose chirality or wall or skirmion, whatever, we can see how that contribution uh, evolves. But this chirality or walls can promote also other contributions, which we have not seen in the collinear sample. So you have to know what you're doing, uh, Matthias. Yes. 
That's, so, yeah, that's Roger Hayes went to another meeting, I think. Yes, that's why I'm uh, okay. making wish, wish lists. Wish lists. So if you are, uh, maybe the last question, and then we'll call it the day. Go ahead. Can you, uh, I don't know if you had uh, Igor, Igor yeah. Rosansky. I don't know if you can oh, okay. go ahead. Yeah, thank you for, for, for the talk. So I'm a little bit confused about uh, what you told about the topological Hall effect. So from the simple adiabatic theory, so it uh, seems that the topological Hall effect does depend on the size. So only on the topological charge. Now in your gradient ex expansion, you are telling that it is size dependent. And uh, so I feel a little bit confused. So how um, these two points correspond. So it is, I mean, the, the, the precise point is that it, it so the, the charge does not depend on the size. So when you have a larger skirmion, you have more smeared situation. Yeah? So this charge is smeared uh, in this one over omega square way over your, so you know, I mean, imagine, um, imagine you consider how to, how to explain it. I mean, yeah, 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 I, I understand what you're talking about, but when I calculate the current, so when I sum up the contribution from, uh, from the, the whole skirmion, I end up in a, with a constant, which is proportional to this integral property, the topological charge. So, uh, where is it in your gradient? Is it just the same thing here? When I will sum up the integrate the conductivity, I will end up with the same thing. Fabian, do you want or... to... Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things um, which enter this. And uh, one of those is, do you consider like uh, um, a periodic repeating structure? Do you consider like... Uh, no, I'm just talking about a single skirmion, about a single skirmion, but I'm calculating the current, maybe not the current density. So imagine you're sitting, so imagine you put the radius of your skirmion to infinity. So how will the local current uh, behave in this, uh, in this situation? Yeah, I mean, from the gradient expansion, this is just basically a di dimensionality argument. And because yeah. you're accu accumulating just higher order gradients, this is, this is where this size dependence basically comes from. But it is the consequence, this one over omega square is the consequence of the fact that you have a charge. Yeah, yeah but uh, I mean, you can have uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, this non-zero gradient expansion, but you can have zero or non-zero topological charge depending on the skirmion or whether you have a so-called skirmionium where you have a, mm -hmm. the, the same direction in the center and the outside. Okay, uh, but perhaps we can discuss this separately. Yeah, okay. Yes. It perhaps requires a bit of uh, explaining okay, yeah. what, what is, uh, yeah, what are the quantities that we're talking about. But uh, yeah, I mean, you you have great works on this, and uh, we've been looking at them quite oh. quite a lot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. So thank you so much for the talk. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. So. Uh... I think that's that's it for uh, let me end up here the streaming here.